Can we just give it up for the choir? The, uh, man, I, uh, you know, it's been such a great day already, and, um, you know, I'm going to come up here and ruin it, so I'm sorry. Uh, if you have a Bible, let's open it up Mark chapter 5, and uh, if you don't have a Bible, there should be one somewhere close by on a seat, and uh, page 474 is where uh, you can find Mark chapter 5. Uh, as you're getting there, uh, I want to just, uh, I want to just kind of set the stage of where we're at in the story. In Mark chapter 4, there's this uh, scene that takes place in Mark chapter 4 where Jesus is on a lake with his disciples, and they're traveling from one side of the lake to the other, and, um, and this storm comes up, and it's such a crazy storm. I mean, it's like it's, it, it's coming over the edges of the boat, and the, the, the fishermen who have lived on the lake their whole life are starting to fear for their lives. Jesus is asleep, which just says everything you need to know about. I mean, Jesus is just a non-anxious presence through and through. Like he just is not going to get too enamored with too much. And then, but he just, he just is asleep and the disciples are freaking out. They're scared to death. They go to Jesus. They wake him up. They're like, hey, don't you care if we drown Jesus? And Jesus says, man, like, be still, Storm. And the, like, he just shows his command over creation and over the world as a whole, showing his divine power and presence in the midst of these disciples. And he, and he just calms the storm. And they're amazed and they're just taken aback by what he can do. But I think what is the coolest thing is not necessarily what happens on the lake, but why he was on the lake to begin with and where he was headed, which is what we get in chapter 5. So that's, that's what we're going to talk about today. So chapter 5, I'm going to read this story, and uh, you guys want to read with me, you can, starting verse 1. It says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. So don't just think about this for a second. Jesus, Jesus, if you're wondering where Jesus hangs out, you're like, where does Jesus spend his time? What does Jesus like to do with his time? Jesus goes to the darkest places that there are to go. And he brings his disciples into those dark places with him. And the thing that I think is so interesting is that if, if, if you want to know, like, where does Jesus like to spend, he, he spends time in dark places, and he calls us to spend time in dark places with him sometimes as well, which I think is important to know. Verse 3 says, this man lived in the tombs. This man lived among the dead. And if we're honest, some of you came in here today, and you've been living among the dead. And you know it. You feel it. You've been walking through the tombs every day of your life. And you came in here today because it's Easter. And that's what you do on Easter. You come to church. But you know you've been living among the dead. And then it says that he, no one could bind him. Not even, with, not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. See, the spirits that are in this man are so strong, nothing can hold them down. Nothing can stop them. Nothing can, can keep them from, from breaking through. The, the, the things that are tormenting him just keep coming back more strong and and difficult to deal with as ever and and I, and I know some of you have come in here and your sin if you're thinking about it you've tried really you've tried really hard to tame it you've tried really hard to control it you've tried really hard to stop it you've hard tried to chain it up hold it in the dark not let anyone see it but it keeps coming back and it keeps breaking through all of the barriers that you're trying to put up to hold it down 
and it keeps hurting you and causing you pain. It says, night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. He's tormented. He's sad. He's broken. He's lost. And he's finding a way to cope. Some of you have come in here today and you've tried everything to cope. You have all the pain in the world. You've tried it all. You've tried alcohol. You've tried drugs. You've tried cutting just like him. Whatever you could do to try and relieve the pain that you feel. You stepped out. Your marriage had an affair. Whatever pain you feel. You went to pornography and developed an addiction. You racked up too much money gambling. Whatever it is, you tried it all. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. You see that? When he sees Jesus at a distance, he runs right up to him and falls down on his knees. Just because he knows who he is. And he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God, in, the na in God's name, don't torture me. You ever feel that way when you're far from God? You ever feel like when you approach him, what he's going to do is torture you or condemn you? But Jesus is not someone who tortures and condemns. He doesn't come in the world to do that. He says in John 3.16, he says, For I so love the world that I gave my only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish and have everlasting life. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but he came into the world to save the world. He's not here to torture. He's not here to condemn. He's here to save and set free. Then Jesus says to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. And then Jesus asks him, what is your name? If Jesus asked you, what is your name today? What, what, would, what would you say? What identity have you taken on? Maybe you'd say, I'm an addict. Or I'm, I'm broken. I'm hurt. I'm a failure. What would it be? What would be your name if he asked you your name today? The man replies, my name, or re replied, my name is Legion, for we are many some of you come in here today and you don't just have one problem but you have many you don't just have one thing that keeps piling up and stacking up and hurting you you have many it's not just your marriage that's a wreck it's also your finances your job you have many things you need help with and that you need to deal with and he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demon begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. So he gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd of about 2,000 in number rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Like, what do you do with that? That's like the weirdest thing I've ever heard. But I guess it's okay because we live in North Carolina and we like barbecue. So that's good. That's good for us. I don't, I don't know what to do with that. Other than this, other than that, if you, like, in an instant, 2,000 things that are tormenting this man, in an instant, with a word from Jesus, are gone. Gone. Just like that. That's the kind of power that he holds. He has the authority over these spirits. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed 
by a legion of demons sitting there dressed in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man, and he told them about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, Jesus doesn't argue with them. They hear about it, and they aren't, they aren't inspired. They aren't intrigued. They're like, please get out of here. Like, we don't want to have anything to do with you. And Jesus doesn't go like, but I'm Jesus. He's like, okay, I'll just get in the boat. I, I did what I came to do. He, got, he gets in the boat. He doesn't, doesn't throw a fit. He says, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. But Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell him how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. This man had been so far from his family or anybody that loved him or, or cared about him for so long because of, this, because of his struggles, because of his pain. Because of the things that tormented him day and night throughout his life. And, in, and, and, and Jesus is like, no, 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 you don't need to come be with me. Go back to your family where you belong. Go back home where you are meant to be. And so he does. He goes home, says this in verse 20. So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis, which means large city, how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. And I know you're thinking right now, you know, Derek, this is just such a cool story, and it's kind of weird and also kind of amazing at the same time, but isn't this Easter? And aren't we, like, supposed to be talking about the resurrection? And I get that. But I want you to know something, that the most important thing that you can know about Jesus, all right, is that one genuine encounter with Jesus can change everything. And the resurrection, what the resurrection should do is give us confidence in that hope. The resurrection should show us that if we, if we truly want Jesus to change our life, he will and he can. That's hopefully what the resurrection shows us. And some of you in the room today, you're, you're like the crowds. You came out to see Jesus and what had been happening and, and what had been done. And instead of believing in him, you went away and you said, you know what? I'd, I'd prefer if you just leave me alone. I prefer it if you just, you know, didn't want anything of me or with me because it'd be easier that way. Life would be easier, be more simple. It'd be a lot less confusing. I wouldn't have to explain all the weird pig stuff that happens. <laughs> but here's the, here's, here's the power in this story. Here's the power in the story. Jesus, Jesus makes his way through a storm. Not to reach a city. And not to reach a town. But to reach one man. He makes his way through the storm, not to try and reach the masses, but just to reach one man. It says in verse 18, which is key, I think, that tells everything in the story. It says in verse 18, it says, as Jesus was getting in the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged him to go with him. The power in that verse is not that he wanted to be with Jesus. The power in that verse is that he had been demon-possessed and he's not anymore. At the beginning of the story, he was possessed by demons, 2,000 of them. At the end of the story, he's no longer possessed by any demons. He's not who he once was because of Jesus. Because Jesus changed his life forever because he wanted Jesus to change his life. And he did. And so when he shows up, it doesn't matter. He, he, he doesn't care. Like when Jesus shows up, he doesn't care if the masses believe. He doesn't care if everyone comes to follow. He's happy if one just says yes. He's excited when one just says yes. 
When one says, change my life, it starts to follow him. And the truth is, Jesus is the only one who can change someone's life like that. You and I can't do that. We can only help direct Jesus to the one who can. And the resurrection of Jesus also is proof that he is the only one who can do what he does. No one else can do what he does. And so you may have stumbled in here today because it's Easter. And you come to, you come to church on Easter with your family. Because that's what you do. And, and you don't really ever come any other time of the year. And that's okay. We're glad you're here. No matter why you're here. We're glad you're here. And like this man, you've been walking amongst the tombs. You've just been walking amongst the dead. You feel like an outsider. You're constantly fighting this, this, this feeling of like you need to break free from things that have tormented you and caused you problems. These, these chains that have bound you up throughout your entire life because of your past or because of your present or because of what you believe your future might be. And you've tried to deal with pain in your life in every way that you can think of. Every way that you know how, but it always comes back. And you don't just have one problem, but you have many problems. And I want you to know something. If you know nothing else today, I want you to know that it doesn't matter who else is here today. And it doesn't matter if anyone else chooses to let Jesus change their life today or not. Jesus might have come just to meet with you and you might be the one that he came to save. And so if you stumbled in here thinking today is just another day. Today might be the day that Jesus came to meet with you. And share his love and his grace with you. And give you a new life. And what I want you to know. Is that if that is you. You don't have to leave here the person you were when you walked in. You don't have to leave here the person you had been. You can leave here with new life today. Because of Jesus, because of his love, because of his grace, because of his death on the cross and his victorious resurrection that takes our sin and our death and puts it in the tomb one time for all time. But for those of you who I see every week, and I love you so much, I'm so glad that you're here and celebrating Easter with your church family. You know, Jesus takes his disciples to some difficult places. He takes his disciples to places and he, and he shows them a couple things. The first thing that I think he shows them is that life changes found among the tombs. And whether you realize it or not, we live in a world that's dead. We work and live and operate in a world where everyone is dead in their sin and their trespass if they don't know Christ. And at your office and in your neighborhood and at your school, you're walking amongst the tombs every single day. And you have an opportunity every single day to show some, someone to show other people the hope that you have in the resurrection of Jesus. That no tomb is too big or too great for him to deal with. Because Jesus does his best work amongst the tombs. Do you realize that? I mean, that's why we celebrate Easter. We celebrate Easter because Jesus does his best work amongst the tombs. We celebrate Easter because when, 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 when Jesus shows up in a graveyard, it becomes a place where life begins to take form and life begins to happen because no grave holds him down or holds him back. If he wants to bring someone out, he'll bring someone out. And so it's not your job and you cannot save anyone. But you are amongst the tombs every day and you have an opportunity to show people the one who can bring them out. And you should also know this, that when you do that, don't be discouraged when the masses don't come. Because Jesus wasn't. Jesus wasn't discouraged when the masses wanted him to leave and go away. One was enough for him. And so if you go into the tombs and you find one, that's enough for Jesus. 
If you go into your world and you begin to love on people in your circle of influence, one is enough for him. Such a beautiful, beautiful picture. He'll go through the storm for one. And he's okay if that's what you do too. And that might be your kids for some of you. Some of you, your kids might be one of those people. It might be your husband or your wife. It might be a father or a mother. It might be somebody you really, really close friend with. It might be some rando demon-possessed guy in a graveyard. I don't know. <laughs> but, but my guess is probably not. It's probably somebody close at work or at home. And if you, help let, if you help them find their way to Jesus, find their way back to God, find their way into his love and his grace, that one is enough for him. So because you have been saved and because Jesus has risen and he is alive and he's alive in you, you have a story to tell and a story to share. And you should never, ever think that that story is ever done as long as you're still breathing. Your story is a story of God's grace and God's faithfulness. And you have the ability to share that. You have the ability to carry his name, carry the gospel among the dead every day. And maybe, just maybe, he'll bring someone life because you do that. Yeah, this is what the Bible says. I want to end uh, with Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2 this morning. That's what Paul says. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You know what dead means? It means dead. It means you had no life. It means that you had no hope, no future. No days leading down the road. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time. We've all lived among the tombs at one time. We've all been there at one time. We've all been there. Gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. We lived amongst the tombs. We gave into every thought, every pleasure, everything our heart desired. And it only led us to a place of where what we deserved was punishment and eternal damnation. That's what we deserved. We deserved the wrath of God to be put on us. But here's the gospel. You ready? This is the good news about Jesus. It says, but because of his great love for us, he doesn't hate us. He doesn't condemn us. He doesn't uh, think that you're unworthy or unlovely because he loves us. God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive. You were dead, but now you're not dead anymore. He made you alive. You can't save anybody, but he can save people, and he saved you. You were once dead, but now you're alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. It's a gift. You didn't earn it. It's undeserved. It's free. It's given to you. You can't do anything to, to get, gain it for yourself. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ in order that in the coming ages we might show the incomparable riches of his grace. You know, that's what we're supposed to do in light of the resurrection, in light of what Jesus has done for us, in light of the fact that Jesus has saved us. Our job is to share the immeasurable riches of his grace with the world 
so that the, that that heaven comes and invades earth right here and right now through our lives because of what he's done in our life. It says that this the, the, the incomparable riches of his grace are expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved. You didn't earn it. Through faith is not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Today, we do not boast. We do not boast in what we do well. We do not boast in our own, uh, you know, pleasures or, or, or you know, successes or anything else like that. I'm not, I am not someone who will ever stand up here and boast in how great of a person I am because I'm not that great. I'm just, I'm just a guy who lived among the tombs, who needed saving and said, change my life. And Jesus came in. And he changed my life. There's nothing to boast about except him. There's nothing to boast about except his grace. There's nothing to boast about except his love and his mercy and his kindness and forgiveness. And so you may not feel like you are worthy. You don't have anything to boast in. Lay that down. Jesus loves you. He wants to save you. If you are saved, don't ever boast in your own goodness. Because who you are, you are because of Christ. You know, if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus today, we're actually, uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to baptize two people. uh, And the baptistry is warm, and we have extra towels, and we have extra clothes, and we have everything you need. And if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus in baptism, you never came out from the tombs to live amongst, to, to, to find yourself in the land of the living, then... I just want to invite you, come, come, come join us in this celebration of life, of new life, of sin and death being gone and being raised into new life, washed uh, clean from all of our sins. That's what this is about. If you've never done that, I just want to make that invitation. Feel free, come. Say, hey, I, 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 think, I think I'm ready. I think I want Jesus to change my life. All right, here's some shorts. Here's a shirt. Get in the water. Let's do this. I want you to remember something. I say this every time we do a baptism because I think it's really, really important. And anytime that I give an invitation, because I don't always give an invitation like this. But when I do, I try and make it, I try, I try and make note of this point. That Jesus... And the angels in heaven rejoice every time a lost one is found. And so a lot of people are afraid to come forward. A lot of people are afraid to take that step and say, I believe. Don't be afraid. Because the only thing waiting you on the other side of that water are cheers. From God in heaven and the angels in heaven, and from everyone here in attendance today. We're going to celebrate like we've never celebrated before because someone who's lost is going to be found. So if you want to come, come. We're ready for you. Jesus loves you. He's ready for you. And he might, you you might just be the one that he came to meet with today. You might just be the one that he came to save. Let's pray. God, thank you for... Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, and kindness. God, your riches, the riches of your grace, compare nothing to the riches of this world. The riches of your grace compare nothing to the things we hold dear. They are greater and they are stronger, they are more beautiful more elegant God you 
you stepped out of heaven and came to live amongst us, amongst the tombs, to save us and set us free. May we never forget that. And we never forget the cost that it that, that it that you paid, the price that our sin put on your head. That you had to go to the cross to take on the wrath that we deserve. But God, may we also never forget the power that you yield over death and over sin. And that our sin has has been removed from us as far as the east is from the west because of your victorious resurrection over sin and death because you left sin and death in your grave when you walked out and so God that's what we celebrate today we love you and praise you in Jesus name Amen